The format for this evening is going to be basically, uh, there'll be three of us who will speak and uh, I'll begin, then I'll pass it to Heath and then Heath will pass it to, to uh, David. And at the very end, at the conclusion, uh, so that is when uh, we'll uh, take uh, a little bit of uh, questions and answers and and discussion. Uh, the the main thing, the main thing will be um, because we're trying to record it and put it into a, a good uh, format. So that's why we don't want to just have it discussed. And since the three of us are not literally around a table as we thought we might do. Uh, so that's, uh, that's another factor in uh, passing the spotlight uh, from myself to Heath and then to Dave. So if you would, if you have questions or comments, write them down. So then at the end, you'll be able to, to ask, uh, you know, whoever you want to speak to. Okay. And, uh, and so uh, what what I'll do is uh, when I finish with my part, then I'll pass it over to Heath and I'll shut off my microphone. So just keep your microphones off until uh, until the question answer part of it. So we'll begin with prayer, and I'm going to pray specifically. This the theme is is really chosen because this week is the week for prayer. Uh, for Christian unity, and it is a um, a week that specifically focuses us on ecumenism, on other Christian communities, on relationships uh, with these different churches, and uh, and this this uh, week has been established for over a hundred years. It's been like the third week of of January, and. Um, and so I'll begin with the reading from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 17, which is the prayer of Jesus for his apostles. And, uh, and it is, and I'll go through it quickly, but listen carefully, because at the very end of it, there is a part that is for us too. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. When Jesus had said this, he raised his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Give glory to your son so that your son may glorify you, just as you gave him authority over all people, so that he may give eternal life to all you gave him. Now this is eternal life, that they should know you, the only true God, and the one whom you sent, Jesus Christ. I glorified you on earth by accomplishing the work that you gave me to do. Now glorify me, Father, with you with the glory that I had with you before the world began. I revealed your name to those whom you gave me out of the world. They belong to you, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you gave me is from you, because the words you gave to me I have given to them, and they accepted them and truly understand that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for the ones you have given me because they are yours. And everything of mine is yours and everything of yours is mine. And I have been glorified in them. And now I will no longer be in the world, but they are in the world while I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one just as we are. When I was with them, I protected them in your name that you gave me and I guarded them and none of them was lost except the son of destruction in order that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you. I speak this in the world so that they may share my joy completely. 
I gave them your word and the world hated them because they do not belong to the world any more than I belong to the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world any more than I belong to the world. Consecrate them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I sent them into the world. And I consecrate myself for them so that they may also be consecrated in truth. I pray not only for them, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, so that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. And they also may be in us, and the world may believe that you sent me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Gospel of John is, uh, it's cryptic, because, of course, there's a lot of, uh, you'd have to really read through it very slowly to figure out all of the connections that there are between uh, Jesus, his Father, the Apostles, and, you know, who belongs to who? You can get lost in that a little bit. But the, I think the idea uh, is about that interconnectedness of faith. That people of faith and specifically within Christianity have a, um, a, a tie that is, um, you could almost say it is somehow divinely created. You know, you think about it, even the terminology about the, the way that we are adopted into the family of God through baptism. And so we become children of God. And so we're all brothers and sisters. And so I think that builds on those concepts of interconnectedness. Of course, the reality is that as Christians, we're very much divided. And so the um, interconnectedness that uh, Jesus prays for is not always there. And of course, the other thing that we have to state that ecumenism um, in and of itself initially was rejected by the Catholic Church and is rejected or was rejected also by um, some of the leaders of the Orthodox churches and other Eastern churches. Because at one time, the ecumenical movement was trying to more piece out a, an agreement that would be kind of like a, finding the common denominators. And then the churches would uh, give up some of their teaching so that they could compromise. And that type of an approach to ecumenism didn't sit well with, uh, with some churches, including the Roman Catholic Church, as well as the Orthodox churches. And so they rejected it. And so today, it's no longer viewed that way, although many Christians who are a little more uh, fundamentalist in their outlook, so they view the ecumenical movement as dangerous, as somehow still having that kind of a methodology of unity and but today for us it is a week where we recognize with sadness that the body of Christ is broken that uh, there are many people who are um, not connected to the true faith not living uh, with that light of knowledge of God that uh, we see transmitted in the church. And, um, and so one of the things that uh, we're going to do this evening is get a little bit acquainted with uh, one of the aspects of um, evangelical Christianity. And, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult, I think, for us as uh, coming from a Catholic tradition or Eastern Catholic tradition, it's sometimes very difficult to understand the other churches, like Protestant churches, and especially evangelical. I mean, we, we're more used to thinking denominationally 
And so you think, well, you know, that's an Episcopal church or that's a Lutheran church. But then we see churches that are like on TV, Christians that call themselves evangelicals. And we're not sure exactly where they fall into the kind of the wider picture of, of Protestant churches. And um, one of the aspects of uh, the evangelical Christian churches or communities has been a, a kind of fascination with Judaism. And, uh, and, and to a sense where it's, it's not exactly Jesus's Judaism, uh, although that is usually the excuse that is used to uh, explore Judaism. Judaism has changed dramatically from the time of Jesus. And within the apostolic tradition of the early church, we recognize that Judaism is the foundation of Christianity. There is no New Testament. There is no true understanding of Jesus and who he is without Judaism and the experience of the Old Testament. And so although sometimes the Old Testament might seem a little remote and um, you know, not necessarily read as much as the New Testament, the reality for those who are steeped in Bible study and theology, the reality is that Judaism is foundational. So not simply, uh, you know, something that is background information, but it is literally, it is experiential information. And so um, I'm going to reiterate just a few things that I uh, that kind of establish the relationship between uh, Jesus and uh, Judaism. Firstly, there is no doubt that Jesus is Jewish. Jesus is raised within the context of the Jewish faith. And his revelation, the revelation which we just celebrated in the feasts of the nativity of Christ, as well as the baptism of Christ, his revelation is the fulfillment of the promises that were made to the people of Israel through the millennia of their relationship with God. And so he comes literally to fulfill all of those promises made uh, through the prophets and the holy ones. His very name says that. Christ, the word Christ, which comes uh, translated from Greek, Christos, was the Greek word to say Messiah. So is Jesus the Messiah? And the word Messiah, or the word Christos, uh, means anointed. Now you might think, okay, wait, Messiah and Christos sound very different. But in uh, the Greek uh, translation or use of the word, Christos uh, comes from uh, or is related to another word uh, that we use uh, that we use to describe holy oil. If you remember, churches are consecrated, altars are consecrated, and people are chrismated or confirmed with an oil that is called chrisma. Chrism. And it's a related word to Christ. And so the anointed one is carried through even in the Greek translation. And of course, that is primary importance when it comes to the understanding of who is Jesus. Now, Jesus in the, in the gospel tradition fulfills all of the requirements of the law. So he is 
uh, doing as all other faithful Jews do. So he keeps the Sabbath. He prays in the temple. He offers the appropriate sacrifices. He goes to synagogue. And in the gospel tradition, we see that affirmed where he goes to synagogue or goes even with his parents to the temple. But he went there regularly to the temple in Jerusalem. Now, in reading the New Testament, obviously we see there is a little bit of a conflict. So Jesus is accused very often, as are his disciples, of not following the laws, of doing stuff that is not permitted on the Sabbath. And this is not that Jesus is, um, he is not a rebel against the law, but within Judaism itself at that time, there is a movement of pious, well-educated Jews who are called the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are well-instructed and they live their convictions and faith through the observance of the law. Within Judaism itself, at the time of Jesus, there was a kind of a uh, trying to figure things out. And Jewish rabbis and Jewish leaders listened or, or tried to analyze their uh, situation as being, you know, the people of God, the 12 tribes of Israel, who have been promised all of this by God, who have been led out of Egypt, who have come out of Babylonia. So they have all of this, and yet they're not free. And so they're trying to figure out what is God trying to tell us? He's done all this stuff, and yet we come to our Holy Land and we're basically subservient to the Romans who are doing everything possible to ruin us through taxation, through puppet rulers like Herod. And so the religious leaders, and this is where the Pharisees come in. So the Pharisees and the rabbis are coming to this conclusion that the reason why the people are oppressed in the Holy Land is because they do not follow the law of Moses faithfully. And so the Pharisees were this religious establishment that tried to guide the people of Israel. However, many of their ideas were still being hashed out. So their teachings were not set up in a written form at the time of Jesus because they were still being debated and studied in the synagogues and, and in other Jewish communities and places where rabbis would come and debate. And so the, the conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees is not so much a rebellion against Judaism. He is challenging their notions of religious observance. And um, now, now all of that changes after uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus because Christianity becomes established through Pentecost, through the apostles, and Christianity then has some of its own issues to work through, specifically its relationship with Judaism, uh, as well as how one converts to Christianity. If one must convert through Judaism or can become a Christian directly. And so uh, these issues are present for the early church and among the apostles. And um, ultimately, uh, the decision is made that in the Acts of the Apostles, we can read about it, that uh, converts to Christianity do not need to become Jewish first. And however, the Jewish 
ethos, the presence, the spirituality, the connection continues to be there because the first Christians were Jewish. The apostles were Jewish. The connection to the temple in Jerusalem was very much alive. It wasn't until the destruction of the temple in the year 70 by the Romans that people began to turn on each other. Uh, Judaism became much more legalistic as the Jews lost the city of Jerusalem and needed more guidance, the rabbinical schools were established in Galilee. And in these rabbinical schools, they formed the Midrash. Midrash literally means oral teaching because the rabbis in the time of Jesus taught that the law of the Pharisees should not be written down so that people would not become bogged down by legalism. If they only knew it as an oral tradition that needed to be taught and explained and illustrated with examples, then it would remain kind of a living guidance. And so, however, with the change in politics, with the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, with many Jews forced into migration to other parts, it became necessary to write and in a sense codify these laws. And so the Midrash was composed as a part of the Talmud, which is the uh, legal guidance of the people of Israel beginning around the year 100 as Christianity was also growing. And it was there in the Mishnah that we find references to Christians and Christians not being permitted to participate in the synagogues, not being able to study in Jewish schools and that interaction should be limited because the Jews viewed Christians as a heretical sect of Judaism. And so uh, they did not see it as a separate religion. And the Romans also, Roman authorities thought it was also a sect of Judaism. But slowly the divide grew and around the year 150, we begin to see different uh, early Christian authors in conflict with Jews and Judaism. And so the divide begins to grow. And, um, you know, and of course, the presence of Jewish Christians, we can find that well documented historically, up until around the sixth century, we still find Jewish Christian communities in cities such as Antioch, and in Rome itself. And so the relationship with Judaism, in a sense, originally was an organic reality that history contribute, contributed to pulling apart and then dividing, creating a gulf between Christianity and Judaism. However, what we come to see later on develop amongst Protestants and even in some Roman Catholic groups, a fascination with Judaism and a focus on Jewish Jesus, um, this is completely separate from that first historical period of early Christianity, which still was interconnected by nature to Judaism. And so, uh, and so with that, I would like to uh, pass the mic to Heath to introduce us to some of the uh, developments in this uh, understanding and theology. Heath? Father, thank you. All right. Um, Father's asked me to kind of go over a few things here in regards to how Jews and uh, Christians related to each other uh, up until the Reformation. 
And then once Protestantism uh, began to become a thing, how Protestants then began to relate to uh, Judaism. And then, uh, so those are the two main parts I'm going to discuss. And then at the end, I'm going <clears> to <throat> kind of try to explain as a ex-Protestant myself and someone who was interested in uh, Messianic Judaism for a while. Um, what is the fascination that Protestants have with Messianic Judaism or uh, Jews for Jesus and that whole thing, which is what the title of the uh, roundtable is about. So first I'm going to try to uh, talk about some of the development with Jews and Christianity before the Reformation. And um, there's going to be quite a few challenges in presenting that. Um, and the main reason for that, uh, as Father's already alluded to, is that Judaism itself was not yet said. It was not yet established in, in the days of the early church. There were several divisions and sects of Judaism uh, that we find in the New Testament. We find Pharisees, uh, uh, Sadducees, and Zealots. Uh, in fact, one of the apostles is sometimes uh, referred to as a Zealot, Simon the Zealot. And then there was also a group called the Essenes uh, who we believe were the ones that um, were the protectors of what we now call the Dead Sea Scrolls, which have just recently been found in the past century. Uh, so all of these groups of Judaism were interacting with each other and trying to figure out uh, kind of a norm for their practice of the faith. Uh, most all of them believed uh, in the centrality of the temple, but there were even some that broke off and started their own temples. Uh, even a, a group that started a temple in Alexandria. And so one of the first problems as I try to explain how Judaism and Christianity related to each other is that there were a bunch of different Judaisms going on at the same time. The other problem is where is that Judaism? Even back in the Old Testament, we, we know about the Jews being taken from the Holy Land in various exiles, first the Assyrian exile, and then later the Babylonian exile. And then we find uh, the, the Greeks had come through, kind of conquered that whole area. And so now in the days of Jesus, you had Jews in a diaspora all throughout um, this world, some of them speaking Greek, uh, some of them speaking kind of Aramaic, and just new on the scene was the Roman Empire that they were interacting with in the, in the days of Christ. And so what we have are different kinds of Jews living in different areas, speaking different languages, having different cultures, uh, different legal systems and structures that they were dealing with. So to kind of really give a real thorough explanation of how Jews and Christians uh, interacted, um, it could get really convoluted <laughs> really fast. So all I'm going to try to do here is go over some of the uh, highlights of, of how the relationship between the two developed over time. Okay, so in um, Acts, as Father alluded to, we start to see um, St. Paul dealing with one of the uh, outgrowths of the the, the diaspora, which was the synagogue system, where synagogues were established by uh, immigrants or merchants who were living in other cities outside of the Holy Land, they'd come together and they'd establish these synagogues where they would read the Torah together. And that synagogue system is uh, very Jewish and was what uh, Paul first utilized when he uh, as a Pharisee, by the way, uh, by his training, went and did these debates like Father was talking about in the synagogue and started explaining how Christ is found in the Old Testament. Um, this caused uh, a lot of problems. You can read about it in Acts, and uh, several of his letters deal with um, 
some of the interactions that the early Christians had with the Jews, uh, specifically his letter to Galatians um, and his letter to Romans, really deal with the law and how Jews are to, or Christians now relate to that. And of course, in the Acts, we also have the great uh, Council of Jerusalem, which Paul was involved in as well, where they discussed what, what does a Christian need to do in order uh, to be saved? Does he have to become a Jew first? Does he need to follow these, these rules or the, the halakha? The, um, we also see in Acts that Christians were called followers of the way. Uh, in Hebrew, this is Derek, the way. And the Essenes called themselves the followers of the perfect way. You know, so this is a very Jewish way of expressing who they were. And the Pharisees talked about halak, which is the walk, which is on the way. And their, their walk, according to the law, was called the halakha, which Father was talking about. They later developed into a Mishnah and then a Talmud. So all these different groups were, uh, Christians were kind of, coming from all these different groups at the same time and trying to figure out who, who they were in that context. So one of the first main things that happens even during the writing of the New Testament is that the Jews were expelled from Rome and at uh, the historians say that this was because of a disturbance called by Christos, uh, which we assume means Christ, but yet the the Romans all saw this as the Jews. So the followers of Christ were considered the Jews by the Romans and expelled. And two of the main people that we think were expelled during this time were Priscilla and Aquila that went and helped uh, Paul in his missionary work. Uh, the next major event was St. James, uh, who was the first bishop of Jerusalem. He stayed in Jerusalem and he was seen in the temple praying all the time. In fact, I think he was called camel knees because his knees were so calloused from praying all the time. And he was actually very loved by the, uh, the practicing halak, halak uh, excuse my Hebrew, but uh, the Jews that followed the, the law of the Old Testament, he was very well respected by that group. And at one point, he was martyred uh, about 62 AD. He was thrown from the temple and then beaten to death. And it was actually the Jews themselves that were very upset about that. And in their later, later writings, they believe that it was because they killed this holy man, St. James, that the Lord brought some, uh, the destruction of the temple a few years later in 70 AD. So even in the 60s, uh, Jews and Christians were still kind of same of the same part of the same culture and we're still interacting with each other. Um, then there was Nero's persecution of 64. Uh, and at that time, again, Jews and Christians were kind of seen as similar. And then comes in 66, the first Jewish revolt. And that ends with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. That, uh, the temple was central to Christianity's under, uh, and Judaism's understanding of what it meant to follow God. That's where the sacrifices took place and uh, several of the festivals. And it was even disturbing, uh, we, we believe, to many of the early Christians as well. And some people think that this might have been why the letter to uh, the letter we call Hebrews was written to kind of explain that the high priesthood of Christ and the temple in heaven is where we should go now that the earthly temple is gone. And, uh, and explaining how uh, Jesus had prophesied that that temple would be destroyed. And there's a lot more we can say about that. But this is seen by many as one of the main points where Judaism and Christianity began to diverge because Judaism needed the uh, temple to fulfill the law. And Christians had a new way of interpreting uh, the sacrificial system, the priesthood, uh, the high priest being Christ. Um, it also caused the destruction of many of the other forms of Judaism and Pharisaic or rabbinical Judaism began to grow around this time. Uh, the Mishnah began to be developed. 
and then the Talmud, which was a commentary on the Mishnah. And there's two main Talmuds. There's a Jerusalem Talmud and a Babylonian Talmud. So even in the first century, the Jews were still kind of fragmented, but they were becoming more rabbinical as Jews. Now, right after the temple was destroyed, there was a tax levied on all the Jews uh, by Emperor Vespasian. And um, this really kind of gave Christians a reason to uh, say, we're not Jews. <laughs> we, don't want, we don't want to be taxed because we're not Jews. And so there was about a decade there where there was definitely motive for, for Christians, legal reasons and structural reasons for them to kind of differentiate themselves. But I think in my opinion, and it's it, many people's opinion, it was the second Jewish revolt that really sealed the deal of separating the two. And that was the uh, about 132 through 135. And this was a, a man who made himself out to be the Messiah. He called himself, uh, he was called Simon Bar Kokhba, which is son of the star. And Rabbi Akiva, who was a very influential figure during that time, said he was the fulfillment of Numbers 24, 17, where a star will rise from Jacob. And so he saw himself as a fulfillment of Old Testament law, as a Messiah figure, and he was going to finally overthrow these Romans who had destroyed the temple. He forced the Jews to join him, or he killed them. And he, he got a pretty big army together. But in the Holy Land at that time were also a lot of Christians. And so a persecution of the Christians by Simon Bar Kokhba also began. And if the Christians did not join him to fight against Rome, he martyred them. And so that revolt was crushed. Hundreds of thousands of people died. And, um, and Christianity and Judaism, at least in the city of Jerusalem, uh, was, were two very, very separate things by that time. Also during this time, uh, the early 100s and 200s, we had different kinds of heresies growing up within Christianity itself related to uh, Judaism. And that was things like the Ebionites and uh, the heretic Marcion who were relating to the, the Jewish law in almost two different kinds of ways. One saying that they had to follow the Jewish law, one saying that the Old Testament was a different God, basically, and that we shouldn't follow it at all. And so the church was definitely struggling in how do we uh, understand the word of God, which is given to us in, in the Old Testament. Um, one of the more famous writings during that time is St. Justin Martyr, his dialogue with Trypho, uh, who was a Jew. I'm giving you just some things you can look up on your own. Uh, later and read if you're interested. Um, and this is where he, uh, St. Justin, really kind of shows a uh, almost a, a replacement of theology in a, in a way, in terms like the church is the new Israel kind of concept, which is, is a real sticking point between <laughs> Jews and Christians, as you can imagine. Um, also, Melito of Sardis wrote on the Passover, showing how Christ is our Pascha, and of course, that's offensive uh, to the Jews who understand Passover in a completely different way. Um, and then the Apostolic Constitutions, another early document, puts an anathema on any clergyman that were observed a, a Sabbath or Holy Day or even prayed in a synagogue. And so definitely by the mid 100s to the 200s, they saw themselves as two separate things. So how did they begin to, to relate after that? Well, then we start getting into more like uh, legal governmental things. Uh, we have uh, Constantine's uh, legalization in, in 313. Uh, of course, that didn't just make the empire Christian. There was Arianism to deal with, the Council of Nicaea. And then his uh, successor was a full-blown Arian. His successor was Julian called the apostate who wanted to go back to paganism. One of his promises to the Jews was that he was going to rebuild the temple. 
and he had the finances to do it, but he was killed in battle uh, before he was able to fulfill that promise for them. Um, Christianity then becomes the official state religion about 380 with Emperor Theodosius. And so around this time in another main area of, of Jewishness uh, was Antioch. And this is where we find St. John Chrysostom, the protector of our parish. And uh, he had eight sermons during this time where he was dealing with uh, Judaizing forces uh, to his own flock. If we go back and we read his sermons, uh, they don't sound good to modern ears, but we have to kind of uh, just take some time and read them and, and you'll see uh, what I'm talking about. He is trying to protect his flock, I believe, from practicing Jewish practices at all. And he's really trying to make a firm distinction between Christianity and Jews. One of his main arguments is that the Jews um, is that the Jews teach a doctrine of, of demons because they say you must fulfill the law, which they can't fulfill because the temple's destroyed. Um, and so, yeah, saying that the Jews teach a doctrine of demons today sounds very anti-Semitic. Um, but saying it in 380, in a certain different context, well, you know, that's one of the problems you face when you're reading history. But I would recommend you look at that just to see how the interactions went on uh, in the early church. Now, St. Augustine around the same time uh, preached that Jews must be protected because of their ability to explain to us the Old Testament and also to help us understand the language. St. Jerome was taught by Jew to, uh, to, to read and translate um, Hebrew. And so he was thereby able to uh, put the, the Bible into the lingua franca, the Vulgate at that time. And so the Jews were seen as an important way for us to be in touch with the roots of our faith. And so they should be protected, as many of the church fathers taught. Around 598, there was a anti-Jewish attack on the, in Palermo. And Pope Gregory the Great um, had a papal bull basically protecting the Jews at that time, that papal bull um, was a basis for a lot of future laws as Christendom began to develop throughout the empire. So Jews were in Europe. Um, you had uh, Jews in Spain, especially the Sephardic Jews. And there were certain protections that were granted to them by the papacy. Now, as we well know, there's church teaching and then there's how Catholics actually behave. And there was a lot of um, cultural antagonism towards the other. You know, these people are different than us. And there were a lot of uh, riots and Jews were attacked. And so time and time again, popes had to reiterate what Pope Gregory said and uh, say, you know, you can't force them to become Christian. You can't baptize them without their consent. You can't attack their synagogues. You have to let them practice their faith and all these sorts of things. And so there were very many interactions from that time on um, until the first crusade that uh, there were these kinds of uprisings. And the Jews themselves would turn to the Pope and to the Vatican and ask for their, his protection uh, as a lawgiver, interpreter of the law. And he would say, yeah, if you guys do this, you're excommunicated, you know, you can't do this. And so there was a comp uh, complicated relationship between the culture, church teaching, and the culture of the Jews uh, trying to live in that culture. Uh, another highlight, I guess, or low light, if you want to say it, is uh, the first crusade. When that was called, um, you know, a lot of the crusaders felt like it was this uh, opportunity to rid everywhere of anybody who taught anything different than us. And so some of these crusaders who banded together uh, attacked several places. There was a, in the spring of 1096, they attacked and massacred a community of Jews in Rouen. Uh, my French is bad too, so I don't know if I said that right. 
uh, and then by May, they reached the Rhineland in Germany and attacked three Jewish communities there. And they were trying, they were basically saying, you, you must convert or we will kill you. It was a conversion by the sword kind of uh, interaction. And many of the Jews, uh, well, some of them converted and some of them uh, committed suicide, even killing their own children before they would, before killing themselves so that they would not become uh, Christian. And so obviously this was a, a terrible, terrible time in relations between Jews and Christians. Um, and this prompted a, uh, a papal bull called Sicut Judeus by Pope Calixtus II, which you can read online. Um, and I can give those sources to whoever's interested. Um, so we're coming up right to the Reformation now. I'm kind of skipping over some stuff. That's okay. Uh, I think I, I might need to kind of speed it up actually. Um, right at the Reformation in 1492, the Reconquista happened in Spain. And that meant the, the, the Muslims were kind of, the Moors were taken out of Spain and either they, they were forced to leave or they converted and this also went for uh, the Jews. If they did not convert, they were forced to leave. And this was a um, by order of the king there. And so some of them converted, but not really. And so then they, they applied the Spanish Inquisition to test and see if these people were truly uh, convert, converts or not. And then some of them fled and left and went to Eastern Europe, uh, first mainly to Poland. And that's why we have uh, a very large Eastern European Jewish population as well. And that all happened around the time of the Reformation. Now, from the Reformation till today, uh, we see, uh, well, we could start with Martin Luther himself. I, I really wanted to just kind of read what he said in uh, 1543. He wrote a, a track called Concerning the Jews and Their Lies. And uh, you could look that up and read it in more detail. In one part, he basically says this, their synagogues should be set on fire and whatever does not burn up should be covered or spread over with dirt so that no one will be able to see a cinder or stone of it. Um, yeah, uh, Martin Luther's not really... Um, seen in a good light in his relationship with the Jews. And so at the very heart of the Reformation uh, and Protestantism, there's a real antagonism towards um, Judaism. And again, these writings by Martin Luther, by the way, were, were definitely used by Hitler in Kristallnacht later on. Um, but after the Reformation, there was a bunch of religious wars throughout uh, Europe, uh, the Thirty Years' War, is basically, which ended in 1648 is, is considered the point at which there was probably no reconciling between Protestants and Western Roman Catholics. And so after 1648 into the 1700s, there began to be a lot of movements towards nation states and Christendom as itself, Western Christendom began to break up into these nations where people began to have a national identity and the influence of the, the, the Pope became more and more limited. This took place throughout the 17 and 1800s and Protestants began to try all kinds of experimental forms of governance during this time. Uh, some early forms of communism, a lot of things that look like uh, Waco, <laughs> but happened right at the beginning of the um, the Reformation. And so they, um, how should I say it? So before this time, if a Jew converted, they would basically take on the culture also of the, the country they were in. With the breakdown of the centralized Christendom, the early 1800s, we start to we first start to see uh, in England actually, we see Jews who 
convert, but they don't want to take on the culture of, of the English. And so in the early 1800s, we get this movement of Jews who convert to Protestantism, Anglicanism specifically, but they want to keep their Jewish patrimony. They want to continue to practice uh, certain festivals and certain traditions. And so this is kind of considered the beginning of what we would call Messianic Judaism. Sorry, somebody's shooting fireworks. There's not a, a war going on out there. Um, and so, um, let's see here. And so then in the uh, late 1800s, it also migrated to the United States, an English colony, a former English colony. And some of the ethnic observant Jews uh, were converted to Protestantism and also wanted to kind of keep their patrimony, their traditions. And, and so by the 1900s, and especially into the mid 1900s, you started getting what's known as uh, the Jesus movement <laughs> and kind of a, another manifestation of Protestantism. And many of the, the Jews during that time, especially in the 60s and 70s, uh, kind of uh, created what's called Messianic Judaism really. And uh, for example, in 1973, the organization known as Jews for Jesus was formed. So that's Messianic Judaism. They're uh, Protestant converts from Judaism who want to keep their culture and their rabbinical traditions. Um, that's basically what Messianic Judaism is. Most of them are ethnically Jewish originally. In more recent times, non-ethnic uh, Jews like Gentiles uh, who are Protestant have been attracted to Messianic Judaism for various different reasons. I'm just going to close by sharing like what are some of the reasons why uh, a non-ethnic Jew uh, Protestant would be interested in uh, Messianic Judaism. And I think it has to do with the fact that they they have no magisterium. You know, they they want to they want to get to the truth and to the to the the sent the the source of their faith. And of course, Jesus was a Jew. And so they're interested in how did Jesus live the faith? How did the early church live the faith? But Protestantism has, uh, doesn't have this kind of understanding of a, of a growing church that begins to discern like the Trinity needs to be clearly defined and things like, uh, you know, we shouldn't be, you know, circumcising, you know, all these following these, these Judaic laws. They don't, they don't have a, an authority to tell them. It's like every person kind of just decides whatever they want. Um, but they are interested in, in figuring that out. And so they, they get attracted to Judaism, uh, Messianic Judaism, uh, for those reasons. They want to study that. Um, now, I also want to make a point, like it's, it's not just Protestantism that does this. I think Father alluded to that. There are also some Catholics and I, I would recommend, if you're interested in this, a, a movie called The Jewish Cardinal. There was a, a Jewish convert named Jean-Marie Lustiger, who was the Archbishop of Paris, actually. And he considered himself a Jew and a Catholic. And so, like, for example, when his mother died, he went and, and prayed the, the traditional prayer at her tomb. The, uh, it's escaping me what it's called now, but um, Kaddush. I think something like that. So um, it is a challenge. And I think as Byzantine Christians, there's uh, some understanding of the challenge of culture. Um, how, how do you, uh, what do you have to give up of your culture in order to be a Christian versus what do you have to be, what do you have to do to be saved to be a Christian? I think those are two separate things. Um, I have a lot more to say, but I, I really think maybe I'm going over time a little bit. So, uh, I want to kind of end by just saying that there is a movement 
uh, within evangelicals who have began to interpret the Bible in a very dispensational way. So there was a, a Jewish age, then there was the church age, but then there's coming this future age uh, where the third temple is going to be built and, you know, the Antichrist will come and all this kind of stuff. You know, you see it in like the Left Behind series by Tim Lay and stuff like that, which was very popular for a while. And that kind of feeds into evangelical Zionism and things like that, which I believe David's going to talk a little bit more about for y'all. I want to kind of um, wrap up here just so that we have enough time for questions at the end. So I'm going to hand it off to David to talk about that aspect of evangelicals dealing with uh, Judaism. All right. Can y'all hear me? Thumbs up. Is my mic on? All right, good. All right, so uh, my job is to very quickly take us from where Heath uh, started, which was he told us about this long and sad history of Christian anti-Semitism, both before the Reformation and after. And we fast forward to today and we see this trend, especially among evangelicals, of this kind of love affair with Jews and Israel. So how did we get from one end to the exact polar opposite? And so that's what I'm gonna to try to do really quickly. All right, so to begin with, uh, like I like Keith mentioned, there's a long history of Christian anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, for the majority of Christians, when we look at in, in the history book, in the history of Europe, be they Catholic or Protestant, there was this uh, belief that the Jews are something to be dealt with, uh, and things would be so much better if we just got rid of them. You know, all our problems we saw, they just didn't exist. When did this start to change? Um, we can start seeing changes towards um, at the attitude um, of Christians towards Jews, their Jewish neighbors, uh, especially in England during the rise of the Puritans. Now, if you remember your history, the Puritans were engaged in a fight with the Church of England because they felt that the Church of England was too Roman. And so they wanted to get rid of anything remotely Roman Catholic and have a pure faith. That's why they were called Puritans. And beginning in this time, we have the emergence of certain Puritan authors, both in England and in the continent, that were uh, examining the book of Revelation. Now, for most Protestants reading Revelation, it was uh, a book about the, uh, the battle of good against evil, where obviously good would win at the end. But uh, for many Protestants, the battle was really with um, the papacy. So the good side were they, the Protestants, and the side of evil was the papacy. And so in the end of days, the Protestants would defeat the papacy and the true faith would be uh, on earth and Jesus would return and everything would be great. As many Puritans are studying and thinking about the end times, they start thinking about the Jews. So what we have here is the rise of millennialism. And so the idea was, well, if the Jews go back to Palestine, um, they could rebuild Jerusalem. And if they can rebuild Jerusalem, then they can rebuild the temple. And if they rebuild the temple, then we may accelerate the second coming of Christ. So we have the beginnings of these ideas. And so for some, uh, especially Puritan authors, Puritan leaders, the idea was like, well, maybe the Jews do have a place. Maybe we shouldn't get rid of them all in mass. Uh, we fast forward, we see the rise of uh, pietism, pietism, which you, if you can consider it a forerunner of evangelis evangelicalism. Um, there's this growing movement, you know, Wesley talked about the Jews going back all these authors were kind of opening up to this idea. It's like, well, maybe it would be good for us in the long run if the Jews do go back to Palestine and, and rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple in terms of the second coming. Then we have uh, the arrival of Theodore Herzl uh, in the beginning, at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. He is a considered considered the father of the modern state of Israel and the father of political Zionism. And so we have the first Zionist Congress meets in Switzerland in the year 1897. 
Now, what many people, especially in the United States, don't realize is that at this time, the majority of world jewelry opposed Zionism. Why? Because Theodore Herschel and a lot of these guys in the Zionist Congress were secular Jews. They were not religious. They looked at themselves as ethnically and culturally Jewish, and they were not very, they didn't practice their faith. So the majority of Jews who were practicing were opposed to Zionism. The two most vocal groups were Orthodox Jews and Reformed Jews. Now, Orthodox Jews, the thinking, the rationale, this is very uh, kind of simplest, a simplified version, but the idea among Orthodox Jews was God started the diaspora. He is the one that initiated the diaspora, spreading the Jews across the world, so only God can end it. Only God and his appointed chosen Messiah can end it and return the Jews back to their promised land. So for these secular Jews, they were basically going rogue, doing it on their own terms and not taking God into consideration. Now, reformed Jews were opposed to Zionism because the reform movement was a modern movement, a modern version of Judaism. And they tried to get rid of what they considered were antiquated ideas. So for example, uh, in the reform prayer books, they get rid of the prayers talking about going back to Jerusalem, reestablishing the temple because they, they say, well, that's not practical. So they talk about a, a spiritual return to Zion instead of a physical return to Zion. All right, so what's also interesting about the Zionist Congress is that they called themselves Zionists. They did not call themselves, you know, the Palis American Palestinian Society or the uh, Israeli or Israelite Society. They chose the word Zion because initially they weren't focused on Palestine. They were looking for a homeland for Jews, but they were actually considering many different offer offers in different areas. So for example, the Russians established the Jewish Autonomous Oblast in the uh, Soviet Union as an area specifically for Jews. There was also um, a proposition by certain members of the British um, aristocracy to give the Jews land in Uganda to establish a Jewish state in Uganda. But again, I draw the fact that Palestine was not originally one of, uh, um, and it wasn't an all or nothing thing. Their first generation of Zionists were open to having a Jewish homeland somewhere else. Now, at this time, we're talking about the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, as far as Christian Zionism, there was support uh, by Christians for the Jews to return either to Palestine or to establish a Jewish homeland somewhere else. What was interesting is that the majority of this Christian uh, support came from main, liberal mainline Protestantism. We have a paradigm shift in 1948. As you know, 1948, the establishment of the State of Israel. And again, this gets a shot in the arm in 1967. 1967 is the Six Day War. Now the Six Day War was is considered kind of like a lopsided victory for the Israel, uh, Israeli military. They gained large swaths of land, uh, the Sinai Peninsula, they captured Jerusalem again. And a lot of people saw this quick, decisive victory as something miraculous and prophetic. And so Christians are seeing this and they say, oh, well, this must prove that God is on their side. The Jews retook Jerusalem, finally. And so we have a shift now, we have a movement more, the Christian support for Zionism is becoming more fundamentalist, more evangelical based on what was happening uh, in the Middle East. Now in the 60s, as uh, Heath mentioned, we have in the United States this Jesus movement. And so you can, some people consider the Jesus movement as an offshoot of the counterculture movement that was happening here in the United States. And uh, coming out of this time, we have a man named Moshe Rosen uh, from Denver, Colorado. He came from a reform family, but his family was non-practicing. They were Jewish, but non-practicing. He married a uh, seal star in 1950. 
1953, they became Christian. He attended Northeastern Bible College and was ordained a Baptist minister in 1957. Uh, and as Heath mentioned in 1973, he starts a missionary organization called Jews for Jesus. Uh, but what is interesting is that, uh, again, the Baptist origins of this group uh, it claims to be uh, to provide a spiritual harmony for people of Jewish heritage, a harmony between their heritage and their Christian faith. What's interesting is 87% of its income comes from Christian donors. Uh, and it has been criticized by Jewish groups for its certain tactics in converting um, Jew Jews to the organization. So I have a quote here, uh, director of counter missionary group Torah Atlanta, Rabbi Ephraim Davidson stated that the Jews for Jesus use aggressive proselytizing to target disenfranchised or unaffiliated unaff Jews, Russian immigrants and college students. And their techniques are manipulative, deceptive and anti-Semitic. As a, a, another side of the coin, we have also, coming out of the Jesus movement of the 1960s, we have Messianic Judaism, which is a syncretic religious uh, movement that incorporates Jewish elements uh, into Christianity. Now, both the Jews for Jesus movement and Messianic Judaism are considered by most people a forms of Protestantism, especially by the state of Israel. Now, the state of Israel, the modern state of Israel has in its constitution that any Jew can return, Aliyah, to return to, to uh, Israel and petition for citizenship if they so choose. Now, this has legal implications because now we have to determine well, what legally speaking constitutes a Jew. And so this is a big uh, issue today in Israel because of its political ramifications, especially for citizenship. And so the state of Israel considers both groups, Messianic Judaism and Jews for Jesus, to be Protestant organizations and not real Jews. Um, Messianic Judaism, as he mentioned previous to this, when Jews converted to Christianity, they were called Hebrew Christians. So they were Christians of Hebrew or Jewish ethnic background, and they just kind of joined whatever group they were around them. However, in the 1960s, we get this movement of Messianic Judaism. Uh, it's, it's distinctively charismatic. That's one of its traits. Coming from the 1960s, coming from the Jesus movement, it is charismatic. Um, there's actually a place not far from my house. I live, if you're familiar with St. John Chrysostom, I'm about 12, 13 minutes away. Halfway from here, uh, to the church, there is a, a, a Messianic, Spanish-speaking Messianic Jewish community, and uh, I do follow them on Facebook, and it's interesting, you know, they do the, the prayers in Hebrew, the men wear the talit, the prayer shawl, they wear the kippah, uh, they do all the traditional things, they keep Shabbat, they, keep Shabbat, they do all the, the uh, high holy days, everything, but it is this, their worship service is distinctively charismatic. They still have the live band, the drums, the guitars. They have the liturgical dance and the, all this singing and stuff. Uh, so again, uh, it, this movement is distinctively charismatic. Nowadays, the majority of Messianic Jews are actually non-Jewish. Uh, and there is this idea among certain groups that they are either related to, descended from the lost 10 tribes. And so they try to make some sort of connections like, well, we're just returning back home, something like that. But I do agree with Heath that um, given their, their background uh, or the soil that birthed them, which was uh, evangelical Protestantism, there is a hunger to go back to a, litur a liturgy to have a history, uh, to have this, this human need for ritual, I guess. 
And since they're fiercely anti-Catholic, they're not going to go back to any apostolic tradition. So they're just going to go back to rabbinic Judaism, thinking that that is like Father Elias. Like, like if that were the Judaism of Jesus's time, which it wasn't, but they feel like, okay, this is some sort of a valid uh, history, a valid liturgy, and so we're going to embrace it. So after the Six-Day War, we have, like I said, especially in the United States, this paradigm shift where more conservative, fundamental, evangelical groups are supporting the state of Israel. Now, again, this is a, a unique marriage because, like I mentioned earlier, uh, Zionism and the first uh, founders of Israel were secular Jews. Um, However, we have now a conservative religious movement that's hooking up its horse to a secular political movement, which is the modern state of Israel. And the idea, again, was that this is all following God's plan. And so we have the rise of dispensationalism among Protestantism. Um, you know your history, the Schofield Bible was a huge part in that idea of dispensationalism. And so, again, the idea that the Jews have their role to play in God's plan. And so God is, obviously, we saw the establishment of Israel in 48. We saw the retaking of Jerusalem in 67. So God must be on their side. So then we're on God's side. So we have to be with them. Um, so, for example, in the United States, we had uh, G. Douglas Young who established the American Institute of Holy Land Studies, who recruit young uh, Christian Americans, take them to uh, Israel, and really teach them that um, the politicians of Israel really need the support of American Christians in order to uh, God's plan to succeed. And then 1970s, we have the rise of televangelists and these uh, end time prophets, Hal Lindsey, John Hagee. Hal Lindsey in 1970 writes a book, The Late Great Planet Earth. And in it, he says that Israel, he makes a prophecy, he says that Israel would fight off an invasion from Russia, which they, they take um, a passage from Revelation that speaks of Gog and Magog and say, oh yeah, that's Russia. And so Russia would invade Israel. Israel would miraculously beat them and then convert. And then at this point, after this victory, all the Jews would convert. Those Jews that did, that did not convert, and of course, all the Russians, would be consumed by a great fire of God's wrath. And so we have, again, this union of uh, conservative Christians in the United States supporting a secular political uh, entity in the modern state of Israel. And of course, this all was, um, I guess, summarized by Jerry Falwell in 1981. He said, to stand against Israel is to stand against God. We believe that history and scripture prove that God deals with nations in relation to how they deal with Israel. So at that point, it's crystal clear, this is what they're saying. If you're not with Israel, you're not with God. And so it's, it becomes an all or nothing uh, approach. Either you're with us or you're against us. So of course, at this point, any criticism of the Israeli government is considered going against God in a certain point. Uh, now to this, I want to draw your attention to the Jerusalem, Jerusalem Declaration on Christian Zionism, which was a joint statement by a number of Palestinian Christian churches in 2006. Uh, it states that Christian Zionism is a false teaching that corrupts the biblical message of love, justice, and reconciliation. The signatories of the declaration were Patriarch Michel Saba, the, the then Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, Archbishop Sverios Malki Murad of the Syriac Orthodox Arsaisis of Jerusalem, Bishop Ria Abu El Asal, Anglican Bishop of Jerusalem, and Bishop uh, Munid Yunan of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan in the Holy Land. 
And the document states that Christian Zionism embraces the most extreme ideological positions of Zionism, thereby becoming detrimental to a just peace within Palestine and Israel. Uh, it goes on to say, quote, the Christian Zionist program provides a worldview where the gospel is identified with the ideal ideology of empire, colonial, colonialism, and militarism. In its extreme form, it places an emphasis on ap apocalyptic events leading to the end of history rather than living Christ's love and justice today. Uh, it goes on to say, we affirm that Israelis and Palestinians are capable of living together within peace, justice, and security. Yet it criticizes the one-sided political nature of Christian Zionism. It declares, we call upon all people to reject the narrow worldview of Christian Zionism and other ideologies that privilege one people at the expense of others. And the final quote from this declaration of Palestinian Christians in the Holy Land says, we call upon Christians and churches on every continent to pray for the Palestinian and Israeli people, both of whom are suffering as victims of occupation and militarism. These discriminate, discriminative actions are turning Palestine into an impoverished, into impoverished ghettos surrounded by exclusive Israeli settlements. The establishment of the illegal settlements on confiscated Palestinian land undermine the viability of a Palestinian state, as well as peace and security in the entire region. All right, so that's all I have. So we ha uh, we're gonna open up for questions. I have a question. Um, my question is for Heath. Um, the the whole idea of rebuilding the third temple uh, is that's a part of Jewish medieval apocalyptic literature from Spain. How does that come into uh, you know, Protestant Christianity, how, how I, you know, that, that's a kind of a big leap, you know, from medieval Spain to, um, to Christianity, where the rebuilding of the temple is the way to usher in the age of the Messiah. Yeah, so, all right, uh, you know, fundamentalists are uh, Bible only, so they're, <clears throat> they have some proof texts that they've um, isolated, and that backs up their understanding of future events. Um, though I don't remember the address, I think it's Second Thessalonians, something like that. But they, it talks about the man of lawlessness and, and um, him being established and setting himself up as God and that kind of thing. There's an idea, it's, it's, it's really bizarre because the idea is that the, the third temple is going to be built and then the Antichrist is going to come into that temple and basically like sit on the Holy of Holies as the manifestation of the presence of God, which of course is an abomination. And that's going to trigger, you know, the end, you know. Uh, Christ will come down and, and destroy him at that point. So it's just a way of interpreting some of the obscure prophecies uh, in the New Testament writings. Um, I have a question about the evangelicals. Um, I seem to get the impression that they concentrate on the Old Testament. Is that too much of a generalization? Um, so I think it, it, it does go back to the history of the Protestant Reformation and uh, the anti-Catholic bias. So for example, after the Reformation, what we see is a lot of the reformers are naming their children, you know, Jeremiah, uh, Isaiah, as opposed to what was culturally Catholic, which was to name your kids after saints. So there is a, a rejection of anything that is Catholic, which would, I guess, constitute, you know, anything that's liturgy, anything that's history. 
anything patristic is just completely rejected. And so the only other history that they have to go back to is the Old Testament, because, you know, that's, <laughs> excuse the pun, that's kosher, right? So they're okay, you know, it's biblical, the Jews did it, God was good with them, so it's okay for us to do. Um, I remember just kind of like um, Heath was talking about his uh, experience with the Messianic communities. I also had kind of a run in with them. Uh, and it was just so interesting. I was a, I was a teenager, like 13, 14. I was just kind of learning about Christianity. And I would see uh, these preachers. Um, there was a tent revival by my parents' house. And I remember they had a big tent. It was blue and white. And it had the Tetragrammaton, the name of, of God in Hebrew letters. And uh, the men would go there and they, they'd put on the, the toilet, the prayer shawl, they'd blow the chauffeur, they'd do all these things. And I was just shocked. I was like, why are they <laughs> doing these Jewish things? I don't understand. But again, I think it's because there is no liturgy, there is no sense of history, you know, there is no sense of apostolic succession. This is where we came from, this is our roots. And so the only thing they, they can go back to that they're okay with is Judaism. And so they embrace it because they don't have anything else. I have a question. And where do we place those Jews that actually accepted Jesus as the Messiah and they live like Jewish people, but not Christians? They are not Christians in the sense that they don't uh, they don't belong to a Christian church. They are Jewish, and they accept Christ as the Messiah. They're actually Jews like, that live uh, like that, and they are Jews. Uh, there's a lot of ways to answer that, um, but. <laughs> It's, um, I w if Christ is, is Lord, then that means um, his body, which is the church, is something you should be a part of, I think is how I would simply answer it. So I would encourage someone who's, you know, very favorable to Christ, coming from a Jewish background, to consider the teachings of Christ and how those teachings have played out. Um, in the establishment of his church and and to investigate the church and how the early church interpreted his teachings uh his 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 disciples and his apostles his uh yeah i'll just end it there and, it, and i'd be curious to uh know how they live out their judaism as a believer because this is again we're talking about the jews for jesus uh group this was this is a big topic among Jews because for a lot of Jews, where Judaism is part of your identity. And so once you accept Christ amongst the community, that puts your Judaism in doubt. And so I wonder how they're able to live. I mean, how are you know, are they part of a shoal? Like are they accepted? Is it something they keep in secret? I wouldn't. Um, that would be very hard, I would imagine, to continue to be a member of the community, especially since it's just such a tight-knit community. I wanted to ask, Peter long ago said, I now understand that any man who lives a righteous life, this is an act, is acceptable to God. I agree that to accept Jesus is to be with a group of like believers and that practicing Judaism does not fit in with that. Would it be possible for that to be a decision for God to make in the long run? We, we cannot judge what's in people's hearts, nor can we say what God should do. <laughs> I, I don't mean to be uh, rude. It just seems to me that it's not up to us to decide that we can say what we think would be best. 
I hope I'm not offended anyone. I think you said it perfectly. I, I think there, there are many different um, um, realities when it comes, comes to a Jewish Christianity. Uh, the, the Protestant versions, um, so they have a, you know, I think they're an attempt to uh, integrate Judaism with Christianity in some way. Uh, some of them, especially coming from the experience of Jews converted to Christianity, uh, that's a little more sincere than the evangelical Christians who do dress up and, you know, sing Hatikva and go to their mega church, uh, you know, dressed as pious Jews. That's not, that's contrived. Um, the, the reality, so there are within the uh, Catholic church, uh, there is a community in, uh, that is in Tel Aviv that is a Roman Catholic parish um, comprised exclusively of converts from Judaism. And, um, and so they have the Roman Catholic mass there uh, served in Hebrew. Uh, it is modern Hebrew. It is not, you know, biblical Hebrew, or, but it is the, the modern spoken language. Um, so that, that is one reality where I, I would suspect you could perhaps find that kind of a uh, balancing of um, Christianity live within a Catholic community of uh, believers who are all of the same background. Um, and, and because I, I don't, I honestly don't think that there is a necessary conflict between the observance of certain Jewish traditions and even religious festivals and the practice of Christianity uh, or, you know, Catholicism specifically. The, the issue comes about more in, within the modern state of Israel, where there has been kind of a double standard. And so uh, people who are Jewish, Jewish background, Jewish DNA, however, they are Christian already uh, they do not have the right of return. They are not permitted to go back to Israel or anything. And so there is, uh, obviously, religious Jews are like the number one target group. But then Jews who are atheists are preferred over Jews who are Christian. And so that makes it kind of difficult for the existence of Jewish Christian communities in, in Israel. And Israel itself is courting the evangelicals like crazy because they see, firstly, there's a lot of money they can get. There's also a lot of political clout. Um, the evangelicals are very involved politically. And, uh, you know, and, and Israel is definitely one of those countries where uh, there is no fine line between religion and politics. And so it is, it's seen as a good, uh, good marriage or affiliation between evangelical Christianity and, uh, and Israel. The, uh, and, but there are, there are communities, for example, there are uh, Orthodox communities in the Holy Land uh, which serve the divine liturgy in Hebrew. Um, I have I actually have a copy of their liturgical books uh, because it is many of the Russian Jews, especially, arrived from Russia already as Orthodox Christians, and so they were instructed not to proclaim Christianity and not, you know, to say that they were Jewish. So when they came, they secretly prayed. And the situation was so bad 
25 years ago in the 90s when the flow of uh, Jewish Orthodox uh, Christians from Russia was, uh, was at its high point, it was so bad that the gatherings uh, for the liturgy uh, in Hebrew were behind locked doors. You actually went to, because they were worried about the police uh, coming in and, and interrupting the services. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a kind of a strange, strange reality. I would, I would imagine, you know, anyone who has in their family um, a mixed marriage, you know, between someone who is Catholic and someone who is Jewish. So that's kind of a, a good Petri dish to check out and see, you know, how do you do it? Because it's not an easy thing to do. Um, and of course, the um, while we as Christians may be much more open-minded to Judaism and we see the fulfillment in Christianity of everything that happened in Judaism, uh, the Jews don't see it that way. <laughs> They're not looking at us like, you know, uh, younger brother, sibling, religions. No, they just look at us as a crazy sect that's way in the wrong direction, you know. So, so it's it's not it's not that kind of a relationship. You can't really uh, you can't really build something. There has to be mutual respect, and then you know exchange and sharing, which there is, especially in in theological settings or Bible studies, you know, so there's that. But then ultimately, you know, the Jewish stuff goes with the Jews and the Christian stuff goes with the Christians. So it's, uh, it's not that type of a relationship. However, it is interesting because this, as I said, these communities uh, exist. They're very small, but they do exist. Uh, uh, it's, uh, um, yeah, you, you can't, you can't be, uh, completely Jewish and recognize Jesus as the Messiah. You're already by that recognition, you've become a middle entity, you know, so you might not be fully in connected to a Christian church, but you're also not fully rooted within Judaism anymore. So there's a, there's a reality. And of course that causes rejection. A lot of Jews uh, look down on, on uh, people who have come to that point in their faith journey. And that makes it, it renders it a little more difficult and complicated. So, other questions? Father, you were talking about uh, what did you need to do, or what did a Jew in Jesus's time have to do to convert to Christianity? there was really um, an, an emphasis on the word convert that because they believed that Christ was the Messiah, they were instantly no longer Jewish. Is that true? Uh, no, I think the, the convert term is more for our understanding of, you know, cause it, it gets, it gets very messy when you talk about like Judeo Christians and, and there is a movement in, in the time of the apostles of the Judaizers, which were actually um, uh, more emphasis was put on the Jewishness of, uh, of being Christian and, uh, and the requirement to first be, if you're a Gentile, you have to become Jewish and then you could accept Christ. But um, I think for the early Christians themselves, they saw this very organic and even the Jews who rejected the Christians who they uh, in the in the Hebrew texts of the Mishnah for example um, the Christians are referred to as the Nazareans so they're not they're not given the title of Christian and they're looked at as a failed heretical sect of Judaism and they weren't the only ones because, you know, I think a lot of, uh, uh, for example, the Essenes, 
were not well regarded by the Jewish establishment, by the rabbis, and especially by the Pharisees. And so, uh, so there were other movements within Judaism and uh, the Nazareans were just another one of these. Uh, but, uh, you know, talking about conversion, the, the conversion, and if you think about it, it's not all that di different. If a Gentile wants to become a Jew, the Gentile uh, goes through instruction and is then taken to the mikvah, to the ritual bath, and is fully immersed. <laughs> it sounds just like baptism. So the, the ritual for converting was very similar in some, some of the obvious ways. So they did not see it as you know, that uh, different until we're talking already a little bit later in Christian history when that division about, I would say starting around 150, we start seeing a very clear separation between rabbinic Judaism um, and, and Christianity with that in-between group of Jewish Christians, of Christians who were fully practicing the Christian faith, who were you know, baptized, but who knew their ethnic roots, their ethnic background was Jewish and were very well connected to that. And they still, of course, they kept many of those things because I mean, you, you have to consider also things like the Seder, the whole, the, the whole celebration of the Passover, you know, that's, that's Jewish 4th of July, it's Independence Day. So, so as an, you know, you can take it as an ethnic reality. Like that's why many of the, um, of the secularized or even atheist Jews um, still celebrated some of these things that we look at more as religious holidays. They still celebrated it because they saw it as the, the history of the Jewish people. And so, so that's, and, and so some of, that's where I think some of it gets a little fuzzy. You know, what is religion and celebration of the religion and then what is ethnic and national uh, identity. Any other questions? Questions for David or for Heath? Wow, no questions. That is a big surprise. <laughs> well, uh, next week, next week we will talk about uh, relics and go through a little bit of, uh, of history as well as understanding how the church looks at relics and uh, what relics are used for and uh, some of the, even the modern processes regarding you know, how we get uh, relics and, and what they're still used for. And so I'll be, I'll be sharing some of that. I trust all of you also received the uh, email that has kind of the schedule for the next couple of months that will carry us all the way through to Easter. And so, and, and that will, I think it'll be interesting because the, uh, the liturgical part, the three uh, sessions we're going to spend looking at, the, at worship. So that will be not only about Byzantine worship, but also looking at like early Christian traditions, looking at some of the similarities and differences, you know, where this comes from, because, you know, there, it's, it's not something which materializes only from within Christianity, but rather there is a, uh, a background for certain traditions. And so we'll, we'll look at it. So, so if you're thinking that it's going to be all Byzantine, it's not. It's going to be a little bit of a, a mix of different elements. And the same thing then when we look at the history. The history, uh, the three-part look at early Christian history will be specifically tied to the formation of the Church of the Apostles and then the Church of the Martyrs and then the church where uh, teaching the councils and the fathers are, are important. We're not going to, obviously, 
you can't touch on everything from those periods of development, but we're going to kind of focus on those uh, those topics uh, as a way of uh, getting a better understanding of, of uh, the, the history of the church universal, the church Catholic, so not just Byzantine, but also the church in the West and, uh, and the, the other churches, you know, the Coptic church and the Syriac church. So it'll be a little bit of an introduction to some of that too. Okay. Father, before we, we finish uh, the talk today, I wanted to say to the um, speakers that we have some comments in the chat and probably they are not being able to read those, but everybody's thanking them for their explanations or the informations they received. Uh, great presentation. Thank you for sharing your time and knowledge with us. Um, and thank you so much. It is a historic complex story, a lot to learn and comprehend. And thank you. I'd like, I would like to thank Heath and David for participating in this. It makes it a little more interesting when you kind of share the spotlight. Uh, so you hear different perspectives and and I especially appreciate uh, Heath uh, coming and speaking from his own background. Uh, his familiarity in, in, on this, this topic is, is uh, much more intimate than, uh, than the rest of us. And so, so it's, it's very much appreciated that you wanted to share that. And maybe David will organize a trip to his Messianic congregation. No? <laughs> Have a good evening. We'll see you next week.